So Redux at scale. So I'm so glad to talk uh, with you about this tonight because I love Redux and that's my first talk in English. So don't hesitate to make me repeat if uh, you need more explanation. So first a disclaimer is I will assume that you know Redux uh, because I really want to talk about what happens with Redux when we push it to its limits. And therefore I'm not going to explain what is Redux. It's totally out of the scope. So if you do not know Redux and I'm not particularly curious about it, uh, please feel free to just leave and meet your loved ones. <laughs> <laughs> So when I talk about scale, it's, it's, a, it's a vocabulary that is more associated with um, back-end development usually. When I talk about the scale, I'm talking about the scale of the development team. How do you reach for us? 20 front-end developers all working on Redux. I'm talking about five apps that in different form factors, so desktop, PWA, so mostly uh, mobile uh, with offline mode, and also na native. And also the last dimension of the scale I want to talk about uh, is the number of actions and action types that we need to support. So the number of features more or less that we're going to have in our application. So that's the three dimensions of scale that I want to talk about tonight. The second disclaimer I can have about that is that I work for Matters and we're a startup studio. So what we do is having 70 engineers that are building apps constantly and just try to build it the fastest possible. So we are not necessarily in the same kind of mindset that you may have in your company. So please just take all advices and all, all my story that I'm going to share with a pinch of salt and consider that. Redux scaled really well for us. That's, that's the, the conclusion in a way with the team size, the form factors and the number of features. So it did work great, but it was not a simple journey. So I want to package 10 tips that are very easy for you guys to actually uh, take home and think about. The first advice I can give, and that seems pretty obvious, but plan a full day for each team member and each, each person coming to your code base for onboarding purposes on Redux. Redux is a complex animal, especially if we got a front-end background. It's immutable, it's functional, it's uh, using plain objects, so we can go pretty wild on it. So plan a full day of training for each member. So the pointers I can give, the official documentation is the first step, that's for sure. It's excellent, it's easy to read. Then you have a set of videos that are made by Dan Abramov, one of the two co-creators of uh, Redux, available on Heged. It's about two hours to watch, it's pretty awesome. Then after you can take the time to read the code. It's about one hour um, to read the full code base of Redux and it debunk a lot of ideas about what we can expect the framework to do or not to do. It's way simpler animal than React, so please, take the time to read the code if you want at least to direct or be the head of an engineering team around Redux. We conclude at Matters by a little quiz. So we give the questions in the morning to the people and we say, okay, uh, by the end of your training on Redux, just figure out what is a selector or think about the RAM that the immutable state will use. So that's a good question. If you do not know how the immutable state is actually represented as objects, maybe you have missed one point. What is a normalized state? So Give it up front, and at least that's what we do. And it helps developers to actually set the bar in the expectation of what they have to discover. Then we tool the environment. So now it's very easy. It's one step. It's basically using the Redux DevTools extension, which is available for Brave, Firefox, and Chrome. Just add those lines, and you're going to have all the tooling. Do it from the get-go. Why is that? Because Developers, when they learn, they have to see the internal of the machine. So having all the developer tools when they learn is, it helps them introspecting and discovering how it works. The second thing is that when I come to help a developer that is stuck on their Redux problem, I just want to have a few common tools to be able to help them very fast. So think about standardizing the tooling in the company. So now we're going to get into something more concrete. And that's basically the app we're going to talk about. So we have different people. And those people can belong to the groups of the dog lovers or the cat lovers, and we can add people. So that's a very simple app, but that's going to be the example that's going to drive our uh, talk right now. We decided to use action creators in the whole company. This is an action in Redux. They're very simple. So it has a type and a payload. That's the, the basic of an action. And usually when we dispatch it, we create this object in the React component when we want to add a user. So we create this action as a plain object exactly located in the component. 
It gets very messy because at some point we will want to add users in a different way or log out in a different way or do it in two different components. And it's very hard to manage your code base that way. The good example we had was with the login button. We had several ways to log in the application. And uh, the day we had to refactor it, finding the 12 touch points where we were actually capable of logging in the application took a full day and it should have taken all that time. So one way of doing it, of solving this problem is actually using action creators. Action creators are small functions that generate the object that we need for the action. So it's a function generating the action. The advantage is that we can define this function in another file and actually include the file each time we will need to generate one of those objects. So it's a bit like a factory pattern. The advantage of action creators uh, are multiple. The first one is that it defines an API. It actually catalogs the way we can generate actions and interacts with a state. The second advantage of that is that it creates an explicit dependency between the component and the action itself by the inclusion. The last element, but not to neglect, is that a lot of libraries assume that you are using action creators and not just actions. One of them being React Redux, which most of you must use, I guess. So the first example is just using a plain action. That's when we connect a React component to Redux. So we have to plug the state to the component. The first chunk of code is what you have to do if you're just using plain action. And with action creators, you can just write those two lines of code to perform exactly the same action. So it's very convenient. Please just use action creators. There is nothing wrong about it. It's just all bonus. Redux ducks. So Redux ducks uh, solved this particular problem. When we started Redux, we wanted to separate the different objects or type of objects per file because we needed to structure ourselves thinking, okay, here are the actions, the middlewares, the reducers, we put them aside so we don't mix up everything which is fine, we're learning, right? With time, we discover that it's very annoying when you want to change the way you manage your users to have to open three files. So in actions, in middlewares, in reducers. For me, it's a lot of cognitive load. Like it's very hard to read and to navigate your file structure. Each of those files being very, very small, the idea behind Redux Docs is just to go to that. Like a file that's gonna pack the action, the middlewares and the reducer all in one file module per module. So it's way easier to look at. All those files stay quite small overall. So don't try to segregate them. At least that's what we do, not segregating them. The big advantage is that it's scaled very, to do scale we wanted. So up to 20, 30 modules, it still works perfectly that way. It looks more or less like this, a Redux Docs a module. Um, you export by default the root reducer. Uh, so if you have secondary reducers, they need to be already plugged on this default reducer. And you export as functions the action creators that we talked earlier. Something particular uh, and that I like with Redux Docs is that we do not expose the different types of actions, the constant, the const add for users on the top, the first line. It stays within the Redux Docs and doesn't need to be exposed because the reducer and the action creators are both located at the same spot. So that's that's wonderful. So Redux Docs was sufficient for us. That's the conclusion and it works great. But of course we tested it up to our scale. Maybe if you work at Facebook and have a way larger system, you may have some limitations with this. So writing unit test. That's another disclaimer I have to share with you is that even if I do believe in automated testing, I do not believe in unit testing everywhere. So that's very important and that's, that's my my point of view on that. Redux love a TDD so much. So actually Redux is the perfect animal to do test-driven development. So for the ones who don't know test-driven development is that you write all your unit tests before implementing. So you write the test and then after you do the implementation, hoping to check up and have all the tests green after. So you do it this way. So why I don't believe in unit tests on the front end, not all the time and not everywhere. I think the return on investment is not always there. That's basically a, an abstract scale of time. And with that test, your code base, you're gonna have a bit time of dev, no time in developing your unit testing and after time for maintenance. And most of our job, let's be clear about it, is maintenance. We rarely develop functions, we mostly fix the other ones. If we do unit testing, we're gonna go a bit faster on the development because we're gonna be helped, but we need to spend time on doing the implementation of the unit test themselves. And then we have to maintain the unit test also as well after. And the whole thing about front-end development is that I think we 
we are working in a very unstable environment where we have to change quite often. We do A-B testing, we support different frameworks and so on. And we cannot just use all the knowledge that was developed on the back end and just take it as a golden rule. And that's my standpoint on the unit test. Unit testing 100% of all code based on the front end has a negative air, uh, return on investment, we're sure of it. So a possible cause yeah, uh, of the systematic unit, unit test, there is the concept of object-oriented metrics by Robert Martin, you can read about it in the slide deck. And he goes over the notion of testing and stability as formally defined, and that could be a possible cause, I guess. But if we take Redux in itself, I think Redux is actually benefiting so much from unit testing because first it's immutable, or it's way easier to test and cost less. The second part is that it's the stable part of your front end. So that's the part that we do not touch quite often. So it's, it's totally valuable, at least for me, to actually do some unit testing. And it's so easy to do and so do test-driven development on it that I would suggest you to make it systematic to test 100% of your Redux code. The sixth stuff we learned is we use payload-based actions. So you have two ways of creating actions in Redux. One is to make an explicit API. Let's say I want to dispatch the action of editing my name as a user. So it's edit name. Or another way of doing it is that I dispatch the action edit and in the payload I say, and that was the name I wanted to edit. That's basically this, those two options, edit name, that's going to dispatch an action called edit name with just the name. If I want to edit my email, I'm going to make another action called edit email with the email. We didn't get any value of the first option, zero. That's, we started with that because we thought it was way clearer. We never got value out of it in, in two years of development with it. The second version was 100% easier. It sounds weird, but for us, it was a big winner. Because if I add one field on my users, I do not have to create a new type of action. I do not have to modify anything. It just, it just works. It's less explicit, but if you really want to reinforce that, you should use types. That's my take, use TypeScript or Flow, and that should not be the concern of the action creators. So reducers are simpler, they just take the payload. So for this, for this example, the second action, on my user object, I just have to merge the payload as it comes. So it means I get for free the capability of editing the name and the email at the same time without editing the code and many other things. So usually reducers are way simpler and easier to generalize if we, we go for payload-based actions instead of having having explicit fields on everything. The seventh tip we have, front-end development is all about side effects. Everything that we do in front-end development is side effects. Call to the API, interaction with the user. And actually Redux solved everything but the side effects. We have to understand that we're solving the easy problem with Redux. And the first question you have to ask you yourself when you start to do a Redux project is, how am I going to manage my side effects? We can talk about Redux, thank That's what is in the documentation when we start learning about Redux. And when we go at scale, it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale at all. Like, if someone is using it and have it work at scale here, I want to talk tonight. Like, for <laughs> sure. For sure. But it doesn't work. I have a theory about it. I think it's a joke made by Dan Abramov <laughs> <laughs> to actually make us believe that Redux Tank is a way to do it and keep an, a competitive advantage at Facebook. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but we were way more successful with Redux Saga. It's a bit too complicated to go in details why we had more success with Redux Saga, but I want to give you a few pointers, at least to try to convince you. Redux Saga uh, has all the side effects compiled into one file. So at least when I'm looking at a scenario of different actions, different API calls being chained, I just have to look at one file and I can use a sync await, all those kind of elements, or generators for Redu uh, Redux Saga and read a story. So that's already a big advantage. I can read the story and the timeline. The second aspect is that Redux Saga is very easy to generalize. I can make a general Saga called API call response processing. And that's just one and it's gonna work for all my API calls. Which is not the case of Redux Tank. It's way harder to generalize. So at least the projects that do have Redux Saga do not have, at least at matters, do not have any side effects issues. That's, that's, that's the pointer at least. That's probably the biggest thing you can learn from this presentation, I guess. What we did as well, so that was a bit easier for us because the people actually leading the transformation towards React and Redux internally were actually backend developers previously, so we had a bit of knowledge of it, but uh, we decided to normalize the state like a database. Not everybody knows about how to actually standardize or normalize a state, so I wanted just to give you a, a small analogy, a small example, to actually share with you what could be normalizing the state without having to learn about database. So we have 
about three users, Alan, Chloe, and Marvis. They all belong to two groups. So either to the dog lover groups or to the cat lovers group. And Chloe belongs to both at the same time. So that's what you would show on your UX, for instance. It's a very bad UX, but that's what you want to do. Normalization of the state would say you would not represent that this way into your Redux state. You wouldn't have Alan with under Alan a sub object called dog lovers group and all the information about that group just under. The same for Chloe, you wouldn't have two objects with the information of the groups. Same for Marvis. What you would do is actually model it this way. So create two different objects and after model the connections between them. That's what we call foreign key in database. Maybe you're familiar with the, the ideas behind, but that's the idea of normalizing the state. So concretely speaking, the first state I have on top of the screen is not normalized because we can see uh, we have a group object with the, the information on each object. And um, the normalized way is just having reference or ideas and a second uh, nested element called groups under. Why is it better? First, it's not always better, but most of the time, if I want to edit the dog and call it dog lovers instead of the dog group because people are just lovers, they are not dog themselves. In the first example, I would have to go through each user and finding which group it is and edit the dogs. We're using Redux down the road to have predictable state and solve all state issues. Well, that sounds like a big issue to me if we forget to edit one entry to change dog by dog lover. Redux is really calling for normalizing the state. To do that, you have some helpers uh, available in Redux, one called normalizer, which is just a function when you can give a denormalized state and turn it into a normalized automatically. So you have a few pointers. You also have the reverse function called denormalizer, which will help you structuring the data as you would want to display it. So it can help you. But down the road, if you inspect your state, normalizing is, is very important. I think they added a section in the documentation about that recently. So maybe I'm just like repeating something that everybody knows. So selectors starts also to be more famous now. So what is a selector? When you map your your state to your components. Usually you have to write some glue code to explain. In that view, I need my users and my groups to actually display uh, my list of users with the groups they belong to. This glue code is called selectors. Uh, you use it, everything that takes the state and derive a part of the state is a selector. They're very helpful. Either you can write it manually each time. So they say, okay, I want to extract my state.groups each time, but selectors packaging everything into a little function that you can explicitly use all the time is very convenient. First for dependencies, knowing which component is using which part of the state helps refactoring. Also because you can memoize it, meaning that if the function is called again with the same parameters, we can return a value that was in cache instead of recomputing the derived state with huge impact on performances because React won't redraw the component. I'll just show you a small example of how to do it as you would do in, in SQL to actually extract some part of the state. Selectors are very inspired by the select part of SQL. And the last advice, and then after that's going to be it, Redux is very great with typing libraries. So we did use Flow mostly because we're in a brownfield environment, meaning that we did have code from before that is not TypeScript. And at that time, for most of the projects, TypeScript could not play well with standard JavaScript files. It's way better now. Uh, but Flow was very turnkey for us, just adding Flow in the build chain, adding the Flow comment on top. And that really helped developing and driving all of our Redux uh, development. To summarize, plan training, tool your environment. Everybody should have a minimum set of common tools. Use action creator, structure things in module, do test-driven development as, as much as possible. I use payload-based actions. Side effects are your real problem and your real enemy in front-end development. Normalize your state. Don't hesitate to use selectors. They just help. They have no problem associated with it. And think about types. Even if you're not doing Redux, think about types. It really helps in your front-end development. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, we're using Redux reducers and sagas in our code, and we tried to create this like generic reducer, kind of what you're talking about with the payload-based actions. And what we found is we try to do these like kind of new custom UIs, and they change those generic reducers. And what we end up doing is just adding a lot of logic to our reducers and to our sagas. So do you have any advice for keeping those generic uh, actions and reducers scalable? So your question is, you, you try to generalize some reducers and you had difficulties to actually find the right level of abstractions or the right design patterns to make them as, as reusable as possible. So first, uh, general functional programming can help you with that. So either higher order functions 
can help you extend what you already built. Uh, way better than injecting functions or callbacks. That could be one approach. The other thing is that you can you can also provide small bits of functions that you may reuse. But down the road, I agree with you, you cannot generalize 100% of your code. Otherwise, you're basically reinventing REST. If you see what I mean, with all of its defects, right? We're a generation that was born or actually we use REST and we suffer from it. So yes, I agree with you. Uh, generalizing is a nice to have, but shouldn't be a goal and a target. A lot of things are still specific. So for instance, I think receiving a result from an API call and storing it in the state could be totally generalized and the same for everything. But um, other than that, clicking on buttons and things, user interaction, yeah, we, we didn't do it uh, either. So you're doing it good, I guess. <laughs> Um, when working with Redux and having kind of a branching state, so I created this app where I had, uh, you know, the state branched based on modules, and so then I was passing in mm -hmm. those props based on that branch. As it got further along, it ended up where the module data was kind of meshing, or you know, they were there were overlaps between what I had tried to segment out. Oh, yeah, Is okay. that a piece where the normalization helps with that sort of thing, or how do you manage once your modules kind of are sharing different mm -hmm. states? You're saying like, for instance, you have something that deals with users, another with groups, two are two different uh, functional components, and you don't know exactly how to manage users and groups at the same time in one action. And so basically, this problem always existed, and in particular in OOP, so object-oriented uh, programming, uh, on which side should you, do you want to put it? Do you want to put it on users, on groups, or should you invent a module in between them? That deals with both guys. I would say um, there is no rule of thumb. The only thing I do is that if there is any logic or practice into your, into your group, adopt it. Otherwise, don't create a module if it's just for one function. I, there is one, uh, one way to uh, take a decision on it is the Demeter law. So Demeter is D-E-M-E-T-E-R. It's a concept where um, it's the responsibility. Who is responsible of uh, managing this action? So the classic uh, example of the meta law is uh, the wallet. You have a customer, someone ringing at the door, the mailman, and a wallet in the middle. And you need the, the mailman wants to give the, a newspaper and get some cash out of it or back from the. Who should handle the wallet? Is it a, a third party object that has a reference to the guy at the door, uh, the customer, the newspaper? So that's this question. The Demeter law um, takes the decision of saying that should not be the newspaper because the newspaper is stupid. That should not be the, the, the guy ringing at the door because he could take more money than allowed from the, uh, the, the wallet. So that should be definitely the customer handling that thing because this data is under its responsibility. So I don't know if it helps, but the, the Demeter law was the solution in OOP to actually decide if you've got the choice of having something that cross modules in which module should it be carried in. So maybe it's a solution, I don't know, but that's what I have. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could dive a little bit deeper into how flow really helped with scalability and kind of how yes. adding types and stuff really helped. Um, yes, so new label elements. Um, so in particular, like you don't think something is nullable, um, it yells, so it makes you handle it. And when you have a lot of modules, sometimes you are changing a behavior or something and you're saying, in particular, just simple, like action creator, you don't follow like the signature of the action creator. It tells you, okay, no, you should dispatch it with a, a payload at that point, and this payload should at least have a name, right? So it helps you just doing that. Uh, it's doing the work you can definitely do manually by eyeballing your code base. But when your code base is very huge and you didn't develop everything, you don't understand all the concepts around. So um, on the action creators, it really helps. On the reducers elements, uh, saying, hey, you are adding an, an, an object into that collection, but you don't respect the type of those objects in that collection. So in reducers as well, I guess. Uh, it's a pain in the butt, though, on all the async code because everything that comes from the server is unknown and you have to stitch everything together to say, okay, Flo, you need to believe the server. There's really a username on this user, you know? But at least it was complicated for us. Uh, that's it. So as you cannot fit all the code base in your head, Flo really help you by automating all your you know, documentation and warning you that you're doing wrong stuff with your own API, I guess.
It, it also helps a lot like uh, with your action creators. If you use the same flow type between the components, you can guarantee that you're not mutating, which is really valuable. Yeah, yeah totally, yeah. First of all, awesome presentation. I love the slides. <laughs> and uh, my question is to you. We did, you were mentioning about the selectors that you can do a, a lot of memoization and yes. all these optimizations, which is great. We actually tried that. And when we figure out that uh, most of the selectors is, are like yours, you do a map or you do a, a bunch of operations mm -hmm. that are pretty fast. And when we added memoization, it actually made it slower because of all the overhead of the mm -hmm. memoization. So uh, what is your real world experience? Did you, did you notice performance uh, of optimization in this and how much uh -huh. do you think it's gonna help? That's, that's an excellent question. So your question is when do you decide to memoize or not, in particular on the selectors? if I understand well. So that's the second disclaimer at the beginning of the presentation saying we're, we're a startup studio. So our goal is to go fast. So the way to go fast is only concern yourself when the problem starts to appear, right? So in continuous integration, when the thing starts to go slow, we start to dig into it. So there is no rule. We only start memorizing when it works and when we got a problem. We have a lot of assumption on how the code will be executed, but uh, right now there is only way to know is to measure, like V8 is a weird animal. Thanks again for the presentation. Uh, interested in your take on the uh, unit testing. So we also came to the conclusion of like, ma maintaining unit tests, it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually went through the whole process of migrating to immutable and we migrated all your, our tests to my immutable and then we left immutable, so we had to go back. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> so, but uh, we agree also in uh, having our um, reducers and our actions well tested. Mm -hmm. How about what else would you test? We're testing a lot of generic components that for sure are very atomic and mm -hmm. those we have tested. Now we're going through the decision what else to test and uh, what's your mm -hmm. take on, or you're not testing anything at all besides the reducer? No, we, we do test. So we use Puppeteer quite a lot to do end-to-end -end test on, the, on CI. We have an app, for instance, that uh, is a car sharing app. So it's available on Android, uh, um, iOS. And by the way, we share the same Redux code between the web and the, and the mobile version, the React Native. So if you wonder if it's possible, yes, it is. And it's 85% code in common, even if the UX is totally different. The data exchange is the same, the, the actions are the same. And uh, we have a, such a high diversity of platforms that we use automated testing just to be sure that we do not introduce regressions. We are I'm mostly an engineering company, so we do not have a QA department. So it means that each time we need QA, we pay users to do it. So automated testing as much as possible. No, it's true. Well, otherwise, we release and wait for someone to complain and maybe testing and those kind of things. Um, but yeah, uh, so a lot of automated testing end to end. So I deploy, uh, validate the critical paths, those kind of things, because you can write down a test procedure, but I never did it manually. I mean, I do it a couple of times and I forget the Excel file that we wrote down to explain the test procedure. So write it down. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, server side, we have a lot of things tested. Server side, the APIs are all tested. There's a lot of great testing tools for GraphQL as well on the server side. I mean, the server is way more tooled for automated testing, fuzzy testing, security testing, all that thing. Um, front end is, is mostly end-to-end -end test of uh, the critical paths, the main, main actions, the Redux code and a few key components, all the components that are part of the presentational library, exactly like you guys are doing, like the vernacular of all the different, so the common language of the different components, um, the presentational components that we share with different apps, those things are tested because we can break someone's app when they update the library. So yeah, that's about it really. Okay, give it up for Baptiste, that was awesome. Thank you.